Well, it's good to be in the right frame of mind, amen? It sure makes a whole world of difference. Praise God. Yes, I'm not quite sure why our bodies sometimes reject the natural world that God has made. The Bible says he created the world and he said it was good. Somewhere along the way, for some reason, our bodies seem to be even rejecting the natural elements. However, believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Believe in healing. Amen. When I first uh, met my wife, she had allergens, especially towards animals. And um, she would labor to breathe. And just like I couldn't sleep hearing her suffer in such a way. Well, if you could have seen the picture last night, it was totally different. We've had an 11-year-old sheepoo who sleeps at our feet for, well, for 11 years. And uh, last night, <clears throat> our big boy, Kai, he decides, it's a German Shepherd Husky, decides that he wants to have at least 10 to 20 minutes with us. And uh, he crawled right up in between. The last time I looked, you know, he's like, that. And, of course, my wife, it doesn't bother her. God, God heals, amen? He heals, and that's the testimony that I have tonight, amen? So we're going to move into uh, what we've been looking at, First Timothy, and we've been looking at the subject of discipleship and touching on different bases to encourage our hearts. The Bible says to study, to show yourself approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth, amen? And so we have been looking at that. And looking at the whole, as we just said, the whole subject of discipleship. How many have learned something from, about Pastor Tim? Amen. Okay, we've learned something about Pastor Tim. How many of remembering the whole particular thing about discipleship is that we're to show the heart of the Father to the world. He should see us, amen? He should see Jesus. Everyone should see Jesus in us. And that brings us, you know, we said, what truly is a disciple? I'm going to move along really quickly here. But the true definition of a disciple is that they are a follower of Jesus. You can't be a disciple if you're not obeying and knowing the heart and the will and the purpose of our Heavenly Father. Amen? And so the Bible says that we are to be a follower. Of course, I've asked the question, is there a big dis di difference between being a Christian and a disciple? And kind of played along with that. And yes, there is. You can, everyone can be a Christian. I can say I'm a Christian, but the only way I can be a disciple is if I'm a doer of the word. Big difference. A lot of people say, well, yeah, I was born in a Christian home. That doesn't make you a disciple. A disciple follows the Lord Jesus Christ. John 12, 26 says, Anyone who serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Amen? And what we do is we look towards having the favor of God in our lives. But the only way we gain that is by following him because we have to Think of dying to self. Say, I must die to self. The only way we can pick up our cross and follow him, Jesus said, deny yourself and follow after me. And he also said this prayer in John 17, 22. He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. Number one, what is glory? We talked a little bit about glory and defining that. I'm not quite sure if we have it further down, so I'll just move closely in this the emphasis here in John 17 is that they may be one and we're going to learn about water baptism and about baptisms uh, what that really is talking about but it's about us becoming one in him say one John 17 20 Jesus continued to pray and he says my prayer is not for them alone but I pray for those who will all believe in me through their message Jesus is speaking that even to us today. The way the world is going to know that he was sent by the Father is that they see him through us. Our message is just not our mere words. Our message is about what we do in this life. How we exemplify him. How we live out our lives. Our worship is about our reasonable service. That means what you do. Worship was awesome here tonight, but what you do on Monday morning is also worship. 
And when you look in the mirror and the very first thought that comes to you is worship. Isn't that an awesome thought? Yes. I, a. W. Tozer said, the most important thing about you is what you think about God. What you believe about God is the most important thing about you. So here's the definition of glory. The glory of God is the beauty of the Holy Spirit that basically the beauty that emanates from his character and all that he is. The glory of God is the manifested in all his attributes together which never passes away because he is forever, amen, and it is eternal. So Glory is the essence of who he is. And when we want glory, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to abide in us, to live in us. It's Christ in me, say it together, the hope of glory. Say it again, it's Christ in me. It's Christ in me. It's not out there unless it's the body of believers, yes, emanating and, and showing forth the glory of God. But it's about Christ in us. That's what the glory is all about. We talked about Peter's restoration, and you guys can mark it down. I know we've talked about this, Mark 14, chapter 14. You read through there in John 21 where it talks about Peter. And we know that Peter basically learned to be really what it means to be meek. To be meek. And that is to have strength, not in one's own self, but strength in the Lord. Well, often we put our strength in ourselves. We believe we can do it, but we don't really understand it's not about us. It's about the Lord's will and the Lord's way. Period. And sometimes we think we know the Lord's will. And we think we know the Lord's way, but I mean, no, there's not an exact manual for you to read and say, oh, I got it. It's about walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. You know, I was thinking about today, if I had a manual that told me everything what to do with a dog and how to train a dog, I'd be just, wow, I could know everything how to do a dog and I'd be a perfect dog trainer. I bet you every parent would say that too, right? You can have all the books and you can read all the books, but how many know each child is unique? <laughs> and that the ma manual cannot fulfill everything for you. You have to kind of walk it. You have to experience it. How many know you learn a lot by doing? <laughs> the old Chinese proverb says, you know, I hear and I forget. Don't you forget what I'm saying tonight. And I see, I remember. That's why I use PowerPoint. You might remember something, but if you do it, you understand. <laughs> Love that proverb. And Jesus said to, to Peter there on the shore when, you know, he was challenging him and says, do, do you love me? In one phrase, he says, do you love me more than these? You know, Pastor Carol was talking about the love of money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money's not bad in itself. It's the love of it and the desiring it over the things of God. We can put things before God in our lives. It's do we love him more than these? Oh, I'll never deny you. But there's stuff in Peter's heart. Peter trusted and loved in himself more than in the Word of God. That's why he often challenged his rabbi. And then Jesus said, you'll deny me. Oh, no, I won't. And what did he do? We know the story. You know, he said to Peter, you know, f follow me right from the beginning. The message was, you know, you, you're fishing? Hey, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He takes us and he allows us to do the Father's will. How many know that there is nothing better than doing the Father's will? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of my Father. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How many have experienced the Lord is good? The world says there's allergies and there's nothing you can do about it. My wife says, no, the Spirit of Christ lives in me and I'm healed. Woo! I don't know what's better than that. Hallelujah. You should know the truth and you shall be free. The world is looking for freedom. They may have a statue, I'll just say, in a harbor, 
But that's not their freedom. Revolution isn't your freedom. Government isn't your freedom. Your Canadian rights are not your freedom. Okay, I better close there and run. Moving on. But he challenged it every time he said to them, and he said, do you love me? He came back also with, feed my sheep. Attend to my lambs. Take your eyes off yourself and put it on to others. You and I as disciples, it's less of me and more of him. And Jesus said, in the same manner that I've been sent, so send I you. Just say, less of me, more of him. Now God's going to work this in our life. And I said in James 2, uh, James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, consider it all pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face uh, trials of, of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. We know if you go on and read it, it says, why? Why is there this testing? Because he wants to perfect in us himself. He's going to allow us to go through things. Say, I enjoy going through pain, Pastor. It's pretty silent in here right now. That's okay. The next thing it says here, joy is not in the pain, but what the pain produces. Thank you to Tony Trice for that. We, we don't want to experience these things, and, and it's rather difficult to talk about it, but how many know that as a disciple, God is going to work on us? Hallelujah. Who wants to be a candidate to be a disciple? But he's going to work on us. If I can already add, I can say he's going to work in us. That was a whole challenge about Timothy to go to make disciples. And, and Paul would always say, open up your hearts there, folks. Hey, Corinthians, open up your hearts. The only way it's going to really be is if we are legitimately humble and also we experience what it means to be meek. It's not my strength but him. Now, what do you mean? Yes, I live and I move and I have my being in him. I take care of my body. I do the right things. I enjoy health. What I mean, it is not our salvation it is him it's his gift it's his plan if will more we become to accept the terms that he has a very very good plan and he is a loving god and we can throw ourselves into his arms but we have some have so much reservation and so much fear it causes us not to move in faith nor in obedience and, of course, who likes pain? It's still quiet in here. We really don't, but it's good. It's good. When I was training my uh, rescue dog, Kai, he didn't like some of the aspects when I was going to go through with him. And he resented it. He actually had a little bit of aggression. We won't talk about that too much. But he, he had to suffer a little bit. Oh, you don't want to go on the leash and you're going to lash out and you're going to be the boss, and I mean in a real bad way. Well, I made sure I was about 12 feet from him. <laughs> when I said, fine, you want your way? And I just dragged him until he realized he broke and said, I can't, I I'm, I'm have to be more submissive if I'm going to get along in life here. If it's going to be better for me, I can't get my own way anymore. And the more he's experienced that, the more happier he is. And the more less fear. Do you know most aggression that he ever shows is because of his fears? I learned that. So when he comes up and he wants to control, he growls at us. Not that he's going to be aggressive in the way, but just that he's controlling because there's a fear that maybe we'll go, we'll get up, we'll leave him. Praise God, that doesn't happen. Last night he was just there in bed. Sleeping away, happy as ever. So we, we're moving into talking about baptisms, the subject of baptisms. Now, there's people, scholars mentioned there's about seven baptisms. We'll, we'll venture into some of them. One I'm going to skip for sure because it's just, I want to skip it for another time. But anyways, uh, baptisms. 
oh, we think of baptisms, and we're, we're going to do a little journey here. I know the first thing that comes to our mind is, is, is water baptism. And, and that is something that we know is what we call full immersion. At least that's what a lot of Christian churches believe today, full immersion. <clears throat> when they did baptisms way back in the day, it was full immersion. And we're going to talk just a little bit about some of the aspect, the background of baptisms. And, and what's so unique and special that I'm talking about baptism? Because I want you to know, when I say he wants you, he, he does, he desires every part of you. Every part of you. And that's why when you are baptized, it's called full submersion. That means even the tips of your hair are wet. Because it's the aspect that every part of you belongs to Christ Jesus. When we are baptized, it's declaring that we have died to self. And we are being risen with Him. <laughs> Say Amen. And this concept of baptism goes back a very long way. And I got a picture there called, shows a specific thing that is very part of the Jewish culture even to this very day but you can go back way back to the book of Leviticus even in the Old Testament law where it talks about purifying themselves cleansing themselves the mikvah is a ceremonial cleansing place this is a very old one and I could have showed you some that Probably you'd wonder, really, I am going to go down in there because every mikvah has to be below ground. And some of them, when they were dug, even in the uh, long ago in the ancient days, if I can put it that way, uh, you kind of looked and you're know, like, oh, really? <laughs> I'm going down, down there. <laughs> I think the emphasis spiritually today is, the, you know, it's a, it's a depth that we go into in dying to self. Now we know that there was the Levitical law about all the cleansing. We don't have to go into all that, but if you want to mark it down, you can read in Leviticus uh, chapter 15 and also in Leviticus 19, and it talks about what they had to do in order to be in the presence of the Lord, and it was about the cleansing. I'm going to come just a next picture to show you a modern-day aspect of a but we've been talking a mikvah. Now, many Jewish homes can have these, even modern homes today. They would be in, like I say, below ground. It's often the lower level, or we would call it basement. There's many public places that they go today that they celebrate. Now, I'm not professing I know everything about the usage of the mikvah today, but I'm just letting you know it is still practiced to this very day. And interesting, when they do so, it's often to make things kosher, yes, even pots and pans and appliances will go in there. Now, you don't go in there to bathe. It's not about having a bath. It is a aspect of a spiritual connotation here. You are clean before you go into mitvah physically, but it's about a spiritual aspect. Even they honor that. And so when they're going into it, they're going down those steps and around, and then there's finally a deep pool. That pool has to be water that is from the ground natural water and so what they would do to that is when they go into it they're pretty deep and then you submerge yourself now traditionally they do it three times as i'm not saying i know everything about it i'm just telling you what they do however i think it draws significance that you know jesus was what how many days before he came back up amen how many know that perhaps maybe what pastors should do is go, oh, we baptize you in the name of Jesus and oh, maybe one more time. Bring them up. Ah, one more time. <laughs> I've been told that they do it three because just in case the other two disqualify for some particular reason, at least one will count. I know, but I'm just telling you some of the reasoning behind it today. But maybe for us, Maybe it should be, you know, three seconds <laughs> each time. Hallelujah. But God is good. 
So there was this traditional aspect that as cultural they went, it not only was for the ritual of cleansing, but anyone who wanted to become a Jew, meaning non-Israelite in that day, who wanted to be basically, as we would say, inducted as part of the Jewish faith, they went through this aspect of cleansing. A traditional ritual, if I may put it that way, that they were baptized. They may not have used that word, but I mean they went through the cleansing of the mikvah in order to be deemed as an Israelite. Yeah, there were people that were came into Israel. That may not have been a born Israelite. Remember, Jesus always, or pardon me, the Old Testament always reaffirms that they were to be a light to the nations and they were not to what? Turn away the strangers. Is that not true? They were to be inviting. You and I today, we are to be a light to the world, just as Jesus came into this world to be a light. Amen? Uh, Jeremiah 17 is a play on the word about the mikvah. It says, Lord, you are the hope, the mikvah of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the mikvah or the spring of living water. Now, the word was used in a play on the words, but it, because bringing the emphasis on the meaning that he is our hope. He is the living, life-giving spirit today. He is the mikvah. He is the spring of living water. Say with me, living water. Say with me, spring up, O well, within me. Amen? He's living water. Hallelujah. Anyone who drinks of me shall what? Never thirst again. We are baptized in him. And that's what I want to make emphasis that what we do today, we're coming down later on. Not that I'm going to try to rush and get there tonight. I am in no hurry tonight. So I will, if we get only two or three, that's fine. But it must be understood that baptism is an outward proclamation of the inward conversion. In other words, it was a testimony to those in that day that they were declaring, I am going to become part of Israel. I give you my heart. Now we know that sometimes God did some other things. We won't talk about that tonight. What they were, what they had to do. Especially the gentlemen amongst the clan. But anyways, we know that this was practice. We understand today for us to be in Christ, it is important to be baptized. But understand, it's not about the ritual. It's about what happens on the inside of us. Amen? That's why Jesus brought very much, I believe, with, with the high priest when he came, saying, how can you be born again? Jesus said, you must be born of water and of the Spirit. And they, Nicodemus, would under, Nicodemus would understand that because being a Pharisee and of the culture, they understood about the ritual of the cleansing, the aspect of using the water to, for purification. But they needed the Spirit of God in them, amen? And that was the promise when Jesus left. He says, I promise you. The Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. And that's what we're experiencing today. So we're going to look at a, a baptism tonight. And, and we'll read the scripture. Now it's very interesting. Paul even plays on the aspect of just of, of you know, not just the water baptism, but what other types of areas do we see the spirit message to us as believers. And the one that he affirms in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 and uh, like to go and read a little bit out of there. So I'm going to turn to my Bible as well. I'm going to go to uh, 1 Corinthians with you, chapter 10. And uh, we start even back from the very aspect of uh, 
verse 1. It might be okay to read a little bit here, but it's the baptism of Moses. Paul says it this way. He says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the Red Sea. They were all, say with me, all baptized into Moses. You're following me? So baptism in the Bible has a greater in depth meaning to not more going into the swimming pool. It's about really understanding more what the Spirit is doing in us. And so they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the spirit, same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and the rock that was Christ. Many times what uh, the New Testament author says that even Moses looked onto Christ. Some say that he saw Christ. He was a prophet. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as an example to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And then he goes into all the things. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. So these things, down verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us of whom uh, the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, Peter needed to hear that earlier, didn't he? Be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except that is common to mankind. And God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide, say provide, a way so that you can endure it. Now, how many know that when the Israelites came, it's like their baptism was the passing through the Red Sea with following the cloud, the pillar of the cloud. They went through. What was the baptism that they had? They were entering into their promise. Hello, right? And so he was making the analogy that as they went across and went through there on dry ground is the same because God divided the waters. That Their baptism was that they went through that so they could gain entrance to the promised land. Your baptism gains you the promises that are in Christ Jesus. For when we identify ourselves with Christ... They identified themselves with Moses at that time, but we identify ourselves with Christ so that we are going to experience his resurrection life in us. How many know that it says we have received all blessings in Christ Jesus? How many know that it says that if he is our Lord, we will be blessed in him? Amen? And if we desire him to be our master, how many know that we'll no longer be fulfilling the lust of the flesh. He says, don't be deceived. Peter was deceived, even deceived himself because he thought he could do it in his own strength. But you can't. You have to be baptized in Christ in order to be successful. How many know that Peter was a big changed man when he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, as we would call it. We'll look at it. It was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How many know he went out and he gave the best sermon, but in the very end of that sermon, he said, repent, be baptized, and receive, and the third thing, the Spirit of Christ. I won't venture into that. I'm running ahead of myself. That's okay. It's kind of hard to talk about baptism and not start, you know, submerging them all together here. But we see when... The uniqueness that Paul used this example about Moses' baptism. And he was referring that as God led them through to the very promise he had to them. It's the same for us today when we are baptized in Christ. Amen. And we're receiving the fullness. Say the fullness. You believe that. If you don't, come see me on Sunday. We're going to the pool, and we're going to make sure we dunk you more than three times until we really know it's all of us, every part that's baptized into Christ. 
Say all of me. Oh, hallelujah. So we're going to go to the next subject called the baptism of John. We all know we've all probably read the story so much. And John was there and he was baptizing in the River Jordan. And so there you go. This is before even Jesus was crucified and resurrected again. Before Paul even preached, there was John. And we call him John the Baptist because what I told you, it was not a foreign concept to them in that day. The only thing is that the scribes and the Pharisees stood very far off and did not enter in with John. Why? Because they thought they were cleansed. Yeah, no. They were they did the mikvah. They did the ceremonial stuff. Remember, Jesus is not what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside that defiles a man. All meshing together here now. And so we have the story of John the Baptist, and it says he was preaching. Oh, what was he preaching? Some of you have been around the block enough around here. saying, repent. He was saying, repent. And then he would say, and be baptized. They understood what that meant. They understood there was a cleansing. But, remember I was saying, we're coming to, the mikvah was a foreshadowing of the times that was going to come to the things of Christ. John is even a closer foreshadowing of that which was going to be in Christ because later on we know that John said, you know, there he is. He, the Lamb of God, who shall take away the sin of the world. He said, may he increase. Hello, now it's time for us to decrease. It's the same thing we've been saying. The only way we can be, de be a disciple is to deny ourselves. Less of me and more of him. Isn't this great on a Wednesday night? Say, less of me and more of him. Hallelujah. You'll wake up tomorrow and you'll say, I think I remember pastor saying something, something about me. Less of you. Hallelujah. Oh, that's a great frame of mind. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's a great frame of mind. Hallelujah. Less of me. So we know it's repent and be baptized. And that's what we just talked about that Peter, and, and you read in chapters, uh, sorry, Acts chapters 2, down verse 38. Right? I think I got it right. Change books. Acts 2, 38. And Peter replied. This is after a great long sermon. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. Now, that was the same message that John was given, but John was talking to them. He, yes, it was a genuine, he was a man of God. But you see, the difference between that and what they were just doing ceremonially all the time in the mikvah was John was saying, it's about your hearts now. It's about your heart. You need to repent. And if you're repenting, then you come and you can be baptized. The, Baptism isn't going to change you unless you are repenting. Christians can say, I'm a Christian, but if you're going to be a disciple, you will walk a life of repentance. And I just made my apostle and pastor happy because I think for the last 35 years, of all I've ever known is her message is that repentance. Our life is about daily repentance. Hallelujah, I'm just sounding like her. Because the truth and the reality is those were the first words. And we're going to come to Jesus here. When he went into ministry, right? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay, so I'm going to just read it. So Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name now. The difference here is for Peter because see John foreshadowed this. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for, for forgiveness of your sins. And what's he say? And you will receive, say with me, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Woo, hallelujah. You and I are part of the, the believer's baptism today. We're that great commission as 
you know, as disciples, we're to go and make disciples of what? Of all nations, of everyone, baptizing them, right? Teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? And that baptism is about in the name of Jesus so that they are what? Confessing that they are sinners, but now they are what? Renouncing the old life and gaining the new. And then they're being baptized. They are receiving the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. It's good. Say it's good. Hallelujah. So I want us to go, and, and, and we're, I know it's a Wednesday evening, and you're waning on me, but just stick here for a little bit. You ready? We'll go to the baptism of Jesus, and we're in here tonight. Now, we know that this is actual. We're talking about the aspect of Jesus himself being baptized. However, we did go a little bit where Jesus challenges us and says, you can participate in the same type of baptism I had. But he only stretched it further and said, how about the baptism of my suffering? Remember, we touched on that last week. Oh, we all love that baptism, don't we? Woo That's why I did it first. We all run to that one. Oh, I love the subject of baptisms. And Jesus, how about the baptism of suffering. The baptism of Jesus. So we just talked about John. And in that story, and we know this, but just let me paint it a little bit. Along comes Jesus. And when I just said John made the declaration, behold the Lamb of God. Now, interesting. John is saying, repent and be baptized. We all know the story, don't we? But Jesus came and says, baptize me, John. Now, John, all of a sudden, sounds like Peter. What? Whoa, hey, you, you don't need to be baptized. You are the one who's going to redeem the entire world. I'm not even worthy to stoop and touch your shoelaces. Jesus looked at him and he said, you know, and we come to this, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness, Matthew 3, 15. Now, it's interesting. Jesus was baptized by John. Have you ever thought maybe what is the real reason that he did that? We know there's some more really significant events around that. But let's say on the beginning Jesus goes down with John because Jesus says we must fulfill all righteousness. Now, many people identify or say that Jesus was identifying with humanity. I know that many, he was all man, but he was sinless. So the significance of baptisms here, he was signifying that as even disciples, there is a uniqueness where we have to make sure that we are in our entirety given to the will of God. Because why? Right after his baptism, we know he was set into motion for specific things, wasn't he? We'll come to that even closer. So let's just go back. So there he is, and he is being baptized. He who is sinless. It reminds me also the words when we just said many times in John uh, the prayer of Jesus in John 17, Jesus even said, sanctify them as I have been sanctified. That made me think many times, why did he pray that? Well, Jesus doesn't need to be sanctified. <laughs> but he is identifying with us. He's letting us know. How, we, how are we to follow him? He's exemplifying. To be sanctified means to be set apart. Hello, we are all set apart for a purpose, for a plan. He was set apart. That's what it means. Jesus was set apart. How I many know he says, I only came to do the will of my Father. If you see me, you know the Father. You too are to be set apart. Disciples, you are set apart. You have a command, the Great Commission. 
but more even Jesus said, the same manner that I am in sent, so send I you. We are to what also go like Jesus and to save that which is lost. You are set apart for this purpose. And it's not your will, it's his will. Does that now start making some sense? Jesus prayed, not my will, Father, but your will. Jesus said that what is a prayer? Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. It's not our will, it's his will. But I tell you, once you gain his will in your life, you begin to experience true joy and peace. Hey, we get healed in his name. Set free. Praise God. And when even trials, be I say this with meekness, <laughs> even when trials come, you begin to embrace them with a new understanding that God is in control. Our God, as we really do say, is sovereign. And you begin to realize the story of Job more to understand God does want to bring glory. That's himself being made evident. You begin to re-understand when Joseph was put into slavery and went all through these things, you really begin to understand this term that we call providence, that God really is ordering the steps of a righteous man. And in the end, you will be exalted. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And in due season, he shall exalt you. But it's not you. It's Christ that is in you. Open wide the ancient gates. Let the king of glory come in. Let us be baptized with his spirit. It's his spirit that dwells within us. It's his spirit that causes us the passion, which we'll talk about the baptism of the fire. It's the passion that is in us that moves us to be able to do the things that we're able to do. When the spirit came upon them in that upper room, it caused them to what? To go out and they were different and they began to move and do the will of the father. Peter was a changed man when the Holy spirit came upon him disciples we cannot negate to know that we are baptized in the holy spirit hallelujah and it's not about the gifts that's not the baptism it's the power of christ that is in you where you are no longer enslaved to sin but grace is your master it's the power that resides within you that you become more than conquerors through christ jesus if anyone's not getting excited it's me hallelujah on a wednesday night Woohoo! good stuff hallelujah where the world says you can't yes we can not we but he that dwells within me, hallelujah, say with me, greater is he, hallelujah, than he that is in the world. Oh, that has helped me so much when I travel. It's helped me so much when somebody goes, oh, how can you go there? Aren't you afraid? Are you afraid of the voodoo that's in Haiti? No. Greater is he that is in me than the voodoo that is in Haiti. Come on, disciples. Christians fear. Disciples move in faith. Hallelujah. So Jesus said it is fitting for us to do this, John. It is fitting to fulfill righteousness. Righteousness means right standing with God. This is God's will is what he is saying. And as soon as he was baptized, if you read Mark, it says as soon as he was baptized, he was sent to go out into the wilderness. I, so, pardon me, Book of Mark. Immediately is the word. Immediately he went. When we begin to experience the baptism that is ours in Christ, it will move you into his will. You will be compelled. It, after Jesus was baptized, how many know the dynamics of his ministry totally changed? Actually, he wasn't even really made known yet until he was baptized. 
That is the fulfillment of righteous thought. You and I know the only way we're going to move in this world and fulfill our mission in him is that we are baptized in him. Now, I'm not talking about going down to the river and dunking you again. I'm talking about your life surrendered over to him and his spirit indwells in you. Your baptism was, yes, that you only have to do it once, but you may do it more if you want. I don't know of any hidden rule. But basically, in the mikvah, they did it continually, ritually, all the time. But in Christ Jesus, he died once and for all. It says, just go and be baptized. It's finished in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But are we living it that way? Are we showing it that way? Or are we dragging our heels? Are we having things where Paul says in Corinthians, be careful. Be careful. Don't be like the Israelites who are in the baptism of Moses. Also exercise caution to not have idolatry. I'm talking about our hearts. The biggest idol is ourselves. I. Right? I did it my way. I, the idol, is our self. So if we say I and we put cross it out, we have the cross. Amen. Hallelujah. Say God is good. I think that's good. When we got down to Moses' baptism, John's baptism, and we talked about Jesus' baptism. And we know that it changed a lot. And of course, it exemplified the Holy Spirit sealed. When he was baptized, again, it's about the Holy Spirit, right? And so when he was baptized, it says that the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. I know I had a picture of the dove in somewhere. No, it's the next one. Yes, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we like the dove. Now, we, die, we don't know if he really is like, I mean, sorry, let me, pardon me, a actual dove but it's like a dove we weren't there but the point is it was the holy spirit say with me holy spirit it was the holy spirit and jesus said to them this is my son whom i am well pleased like the words could could it be anything of more significance or or better or like a word of, or thus or the earth shook and brought them to their knees. No, he came to fulfill righteousness and he went and he was baptized. And then he moved and was compelled. How many know everything changed after that? But the Father affirmed that calling. How many want the Father to say, this is my son, this is my daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Let us pray together. Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for all those who have watched online. I pray, Lord, that this has been a blessing. Lord, we just give this to you tonight, that which is of you, that it will remain deep in our hearts. And we thank you. We do acknowledge you, Holy Spirit, that you are ever-present. You're always with us. You abide within us. We thank you. We ask that you will water this word. We thank you for the significance, Lord God, what it means to be fully given to you. Lord, we thank you for the move of the Spirit in this place. We thank you that you're moving in our hearts. And Lord, you are changing us. And Lord, thank you, Father, that we are seeing the glory of God. Amen. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord bless you. I know Pastor Carol will be here on Sunday. We look forward to that as we gather again together at that time. Amen.